Good evening, everyone, those of you who are joining us tonight. I hope you can uh, see some uh, of the presentation uh, at the moment. Currently, we have quite a few people still joining, so I'll be admitting people um, as they come through, and we will wait for a minute or two before we, we start our webinar tonight. Um, tonight's webinar is going to be presented by me, and I'll tell a little bit about myself in the next uh, uh, before we before we start everything, and it will focus on um, giving you some tips for your consultation, uh, some tips as well that you can use to adapt uh, your consultation style to different parts of the world if you are working in different parts of the world or if you are traveling, um, and the ultimate goal here is to give you a few practical tips uh, that will be useful for you in terms of explaining what you want to do to your clients uh, and in terms of improving their compliance with your request. And of course, obviously, we're doing that with the, the purpose of uh, benefiting the patient in front of us. Um, I will uh, add a few things before we start. The first one is that we are focusing particularly in small animal consultations for this webinar. Uh, However, uh, a lot of these principles can be applied in different types of consultations with a few nuances, with a few changes, um, with the way that we are presenting the communication style to our clients. Um, particularly with, with horse and equine consultations, these can be adapted to that with less uh, time restraints than when you are uh, working in, in a, a small animal practice or an exotics practice. Um, then at the same time, um, some things will be quite different from country to country, and that's one of the things that I'm going to start by approaching today, uh, particularly for those who are interested in uh, working in different countries or traveling abroad and are wondering how to adapt the consultation style to uh, a new culture and a new uh, environment as well. Uh, some of you uh, have probably been in touch with me in the past when I was still responsible for UK Vet Move. Uh, therefore, we were working uh, a lot with vets moving to UK practice, and a lot of this is based on UK practice. However, like I was explaining, a lot of this is also something that can be applied in the, uh, different ways, taking into consideration what are the cultural differences between different countries and different communities that you have throughout. So. The webinar focuses on the consultation, yes, particularly on the small animal consultation, but it can also be applied to uh, other areas. The second thing uh, for you to know is that you don't need to be taking notes about this because this is going to be recorded. I hope it is working already, and I believe it is. Um, so uh, you will then receive the link to the recording uh, for, uh, for the entire session afterwards. Uh, you uh, will also be able to access um, a CPR code, a CPR code, uh, a QR code at the end of this presentation of the webinar. You have the QR code available for the One CPD app, uh, with a few questions to help you reflect on what you're gaining from this. Um, now that there's been a couple of minutes for people to join and get comfortable in their seats, uh, we're going to start with uh, with the, the webinar. If for some reason something is not working, let me know. Uh, I won't have full access to the chat, but I will be checking the chat. And also there's a part of this that is going to have some questions for you, uh, which, uh, which means then that you will be asked to put a few things in the chat box uh, just to discuss uh, a, a case that we have uh, further down uh, in this presentation. I'm going to start by uh, presenting myself to those of you who do not me do not know me and who do not know Univets Global because Univets Global is a rebrand um, and it is a fusion of different things that uh, existed and that I had um, put together uh, in the past. Uh, so some of you will know me from UK Vet Move or Vet Abroad or Practice Aid, and some of you may have heard about me if you ever spoke about uh, Spay Academy. Uh, and doing uh, going to Spain to spay dogs. Um, this year, everything came together into this new brand of uh, which is called Univets Global, where, in which we focus uh, currently uh, in promoting uh, particularly 
friendly environments that are conductive of learning for us vets to develop confidence within our own skills. And we're talking about professional skills here. And we're just talking about hands-on uh, academies that we run both in-person and uh, distance-based for uh, development of specific professional skills, focusing on developing confidence and not just competence with those particular skills. Um, I, for those of you who have not read the name on the first uh, slide, uh, I, I am Andrea. Um, I am originally from Portugal. I studied in Portugal and I graduated from Portugal and then I started my career in the UK. This week I am working uh, in the UK. Uh, so I am in Scotland right now, uh, leaving tomorrow back to sunny Portugal. <laughs> um, uh, I have worked mostly with small animals, although I, in, I started my career in mixed practice but I then uh, focus more on small animals and particularly felines. I have worked now in different countries as well. And of course there's a bit of experience and a bit of differences in culture shock when you go from one place to the other. And when you have to start to juggle two types of medicine um, and two types of clients uh, with, with everything. So uh, what I wanted to do with this webinar was to promote uh, specific tips that some of you may already, uh, some of these you may already know and you probably already use, but hopefully if, uh, if I can provide, especially for those who are new graduates or who are still students, if I can provide a little bit of insight on um, some tips and tricks for the consultation, that can probably make a big difference for some of you in the way that you approach your consultations, regardless of where you are in the world. Um, and, and, and how you are practicing veterinary medicine. So um, what we're gonna be focusing on throughout this, this webinar uh, is about uh, earning the respect of clients in different parts of the world. And so a, a little touch here on different cultural backgrounds. Um, I'm gonna share with you a few uh, structures for the consultation and I'm gonna share with you the one that I use and the way that I adapt it. Uh, and uh, within that structure, we're going to focus on two or three parts of that structure and share specific practical advice uh, on, on how to improve that specific part of the, co of the consultation. The first thing that I want to highlight uh, about the consultation is that the way you conduct the consultation will rely heavily where you are practicing medicine. But at the same time, there is a series of principles that you can follow for all of your consultations, regardless of where you are. The, the biggest part uh, for you to take into consideration with different consultation styles is that uh, depending on where you are practicing, there's going to be a different focus that you need to have between how much you develop the personal relationship with the client in the consultation versus how much of a professional position and posture you are having uh, and basically how personal you get. Uh, and this is to do with how different cultures perceive the relationship with each other. So uh, this is also one of the reasons why there's a lot of shock when you go from one country to the other, particularly when those countries have different spectrums of relations with, um, within their own community. So this is one very simple model that I am sharing with you, which probably several of you have already heard about this one um, uh, when you have discussed this in the past, which is talking about different culture, uh, culture styles and the scale of uh, culture styles. Um, this one here focuses on um, three different types of characterizations, multi-active cultures, linear active cultures, and reactive cultures, and puts them on a little scale here. What's important to understand here is that these definitions, of course, as you can see, there's a little scale here. If you focus on the linear active left side, you will see that on the, the most linear active culture uh, tends to be Central Europe. We're talking here about Germany, for instance. Uh, we're talking about Switzerland. And then close to that, but leaning towards the reactive part is the UK and Sweden and Finland. But then if you go to the multi-active at the top, you start to see a big difference uh, when you when you look, for instance, at multi-active cultures and you see towards the linear active, Italy, Portugal, Spain. I share this a lot because it is very common and has been up until Brexit, very common for vets from uh, Eastern Europe and South Europe, South Europe to move over to the UK. 
this was one of the reasons why there was such a big shock in terms of adapting to working in the UK. What is multi-active well, multi and linear active and reactive? Uh, this is about the perception of time organization, task management, and how to develop trust. A multi-active culture, we're talking about Italy, Spain, Brazil, etc. Those cultures that are the most multi-active prefer to establish relationships based on interpersonal uh, uh, connections. Therefore, you basically need to be friends with each other and you, your competence is defined on your personal relationship. On top of that, there is a prevalence to the relationship versus the task. And also the time organization is completely different from the linear active culture. Time organization is free. Uh, so it, it, it's very common up until COVID, uh, there were no booked appointments for in, in Portugal or Spain. People just walk in. Um, the time, the, the, the schedule is not planned, it's not organized. When these people, uh, and I personally moved to the UK, we are faced with a linear active culture, which is a culture that has structure with the time that pays a lot of attention to uh, task uh, development and the task prevails over the relationship. In other words, when we're talking about this, we're talking about a culture that uh, prefers to have a consultation from a perspective of a, of a vet. The client prefers to go, to go to the consultation and be heard as a client and have the problem solved versus knowing who the vet is and their story and making a little talk about football or the weather. The reactive, is a culture that we don't tend to see as much uh, within Europe because it tends to be more seen in Asia um, uh, and so on. Um, the reactive culture is one that tends to um, react to the opposing uh, interlocutor, so the person that is speaking to that. So they don't share their opinions easily um, and they listen and respond to what they listen to. Uh, within Europe, the most reactive culture is Finland, and you can see in the spectrum of the linear active to the reactive, um, Finland is actually is a little bit more, more towards a uh, linear active. It just means that it's a little bit more hard to read these people, um, and that there is a mix of uh, communication that is very important in these cases. Um, the the multi-active uh, cultures tolerate uh, more uh, circling in the communication within the consultation and they don't the clients don't necessarily expect the structure uh, of, for the consultation a b c or d uh, also they are uh, willing to spend more time in consultations so it is very common for a consultation in italy or portugal to last 30 minutes 45 minutes one hour long a normal appointment uh, because that's how long we are taking to talk to the client and to gain the trust of the client by developing the relationship uh, with the client. In the UK, a lot of appointments are 10 minutes long or 15 minutes long because we don't need to be friends with our clients. It's good to establish a trust uh, relationship, which we're going to talk about, but we don't need to know everything about them. They don't need to know everything about us. They come in with a purpose. They know that there is a certain structure, a certain thing that are going to happen in many consultations, especially if it's not the first time they've been to the vet. And they uh, expect us to do our job and just do the questions, do what we need to do and finish this. Uh, and they can go away after 15 minutes quite happily. Uh, so the way that we run our appointments uh, and how much time we spend with the appointments how annoyed the clients are if we deviate from a, uh, uh, an expected um, structure depends a bit on uh, what the client we have in front of us. The reason why I'm also sharing this, particularly for those colleagues who are from the UK, uh, is because it is also, and also the other, other countries, but in the UK, you have, um, uh, we start to have more and more clients that are from different countries and they have moved to the UK. Um, and a lot of times those cultures are slightly different from the British culture. And if those people are integrating in the culture, those clients will behave differently from the British client and can be hard to read if we are not familiar with these differences. Um, but this part was a very abbreviated version for things to for us to have a look at, uh, because as we have seen, most of the times we are going to follow a structure anyway. And there's a very simple reason for us to follow method and to have this in our mind. It's because if we follow the method, 
we are much more likely to avoid making mistakes, to avoid forgetting um, checking things. Uh, and therefore we are way more likely to be able to do a, a repeat the experience of creating a good experience for the client, for the animal, and also clinically for ourselves. And that's the reason why, even if we don't always follow the method, because we are doing something that is a technical uh, skill, being a, a, running a consultation is a technical skill that we learn, uh, usually if we follow method, we are gonna get the best outcomes. And that's the reason why we are uh, looking at uh, developing a method. So like I was saying, having the method is going to increase the chances of getting our message across to the client because um, the more time, the more times we practice something and we, we explain something, the more likely it is that next time we do it, we do it a little bit better. Uh, we ourselves get, get to feel more confident in what we are doing because we are doing something that we already know how to do. So we don't feel the insecurity of changing, of doing something different. And um, of course, if you always follow the same method, we are much more likely to uh, miss steps. And of course, it, much more likely to make mistakes because you are always doing the same thing uh, in, a, in a, a following certain principles. The structure itself can change a bit, but you will always have uh, principles to follow with, uh, with the, the consultation. So like we've seen, we can change it slightly for different countries, different cultures, but the principles will always be the same. The pillars of a, each consultation are these four. Now, these pillars are here for the perspective of the client and for us as vets to provide a service to our client, which is the pet owner or whoever is accompanying the, the, the pet. It is not the outcome or the most ideal outcome for the practice that is money oriented or that has certain goals to achieve and does not rely on achieving financial success by uh, achieving client satisfaction which is, uh, in my opinion, is not the best way of working. Um, so I, I brought here the pillars of the consultation that focuses on clients and pets, and that as a consequence of providing good services is going to bring more compliance and therefore better clients who come back and who pay bills. The four pillars of the consultation are going to revolve around the client and solving the problem that the client perceives exists. Do that in the shortest amount of time possible, reasonably possible, with the smallest investment possible, with the best patient outcome. In other words, we need to fix what the client thinks is the problem, plus what is the actual problem that the pet has. Do this ideally with a reasonable budget and not unnecessary testing and unnecessary expenses, uh, expenses and in a reasonable amount of time, which is the shortest amount of time possible. For practices, of course, when we look at the smallest investment possible, that is not what a practice wants, but we as vets exist for our patients to have the best outcome that they can have. And we do not need to blow budgets. If we, there's no reason for us to um, try to get the most expensive options if we have similarly uh, effective options for our outcomes, for our goals that provide the same patient outcome. And we don't necessarily do that, most of us anyway. So based on that, uh, one of the methods that I want to share, particularly for those who are not from the UK and who have probably not been exposed to this method, is the Calgary Cambridge method for the consultation, which is a shared uh, consultation uh, model that exists, uh, adapted from human medicine uh, and a GP practice, um, so general practitioners, which focuses uh, on uh, building a relationship with, uh, with the client, in this case it's with the patient, um, in our case, it's with the client. Uh, at the same time, having a flow, as we have seen, to the consultation, and it has a different series, different series of steps, the steps from the uh, initial uh, part of the session to the history, which is what they call here gathering information, to the physical examination, which you will see. And some a lot of people complain that even in uh, NHS and other health systems, the, the GPs don't do this anymore or some of them don't do this anymore, they don't even do an examination. Then there is the entire discussion, 
and then there is a session uh, closure. Uh, I personally have a different model, which is the one that I'm going to share with you, which the, derives from this one, but has a little bit more of a few adaptations for uh, veterinary practice, um, which are free and welcome to follow through. And this is what most of you will be doing anyway, if you have some sort of structure. So there's three parts to the consultation. There is the preparation for the consultation. There is the consultation itself, and there is the closure, which is what happens after the patient has left the, the consultation room, but we still have things to do for that patient um, uh, within the allotted time for our consultation. So in the UK, all of these three steps usually take place within 10 to 15 minutes, depends on how long your consultation is. If you are very lucky and you have a practice that is, that is well managed, you may have a 20 minute slot. If you have a new client or a complicated case, you may have a 30 minute slot uh, or a double appointment book for days. Um, before the, cl the client and the pet come into the room, particularly for those who are already <laughs> seeing uh, owners, uh, we will have a, a stage of preparing for that patient where we are should be preparing ourselves uh, and the room, cleaning the room, disinfecting the room, making sure we're clean, and of course, checking the previous history and at least trying to find out what the patient is in for, what patient we're going to see, is it a dog, is it a cat, uh, is it a he or is it a she? Um, then we have different uh, stages of the consultation, which you would see they are uh, they mimic what was uh, in the Calgary Cambridge uh, model, uh, but I separate them, uh, not all of them, but a lot of them are separated uh, because these will also depend on where you are in the world, how much emphasis you give to each one of them. Uh, so you normally will start by introducing yourself and greeting the patient uh, and the owner, and a lot of times you don't uh, tend to uh, mention your name in certain places. In other countries, that's the first thing that you do. And um, the listening stage, I did not put, uh, and I do not tend to write down history taking or anamnesis. I tend to put listening because I tend to focus on, on that stage of the consultation as the period that I, I need to be focused on what the client is saying, because this is the stage where I need to understand what do they think is wrong while getting clues to what is effectively wrong. And if I don't pay attention and I don't listen to the client and I miss what the client thinks the problem is, even if I know exactly what's wrong with the pet and even if I treat the pet and even if the pet goes happy and healthy, this client will not think I've done a good job because I did not understand what his problem was or her problem was. Then I put together clinical assessment and uh, differentials. Uh, the reason being the clinical assessment is our physical examination and our examinations, but this is a parallel. Uh, while as we are doing that, we are doing this in parallel with organizing for ourselves the list of differentials. And once we have the list of differentials is when we go to the communication, the strongly um, focused communication part of the uh, uh, consultation where we are the ones doing the conversation and the client is the one listening. But based on that is when the decision is made, which is a shared decision and is an informed decision from the owner after having discussed everything. And uh, a lot of times there is also a period of action that we need to focus on. Like if we decide to do a certain treatment, there is a period of the consultation that has to be dedicated to us administering drugs, prescribing medication. If you are unlucky and live in a very bureaucrat bureaucratic country like what in Europe, on the, in the European Union, you may need to prescribe the drugs, you may need to use the fancy platforms to do the prescription, you may need to print medication, the labels, you may need to dispense the medication. So you actually need to have time to uh, do practical things. Uh, and a lot of times you then need to finish your consultation with a plan for that client and understand that everything is, uh, and, uh, 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 you're on the same page, uh, all of you. After the client goes away, you still have work to do and you still need to do the pricing. You still need to do the clinical notes for the patient. And I prefer whenever I can to do this right after the appointment and include this in my appointment time. And I tend to say that I prefer to spend three minutes doing this and having someone else wait for three minutes than me forgetting, me then not remembering something like putting a heart murmur in the clinical notes of the vaccination. Um, and then me having to do four or five or six of these at the end of the day after a long day where I don't remember anything anymore. Realistically, you very rarely will spend more than five minutes for most of your cases 
doing clinical notes and putting the prices up. And most of the times it takes you a lot less, a lot less time than that. So I prefer to make the next person three minutes late than make me 35 minutes late at the end of the entire um, uh, session. Um, I have a question from Caitlin. What are your thoughts about doing your physical exam and listening to the client uh, at the same time, uh, then slipping out for a few minutes to read through your notes and think about things without you around? Okay, if you have time, yes. If you don't have time, um, I try as much as possible to separate the listening stage from the clinical assessment. The reason being, I am talking to the client when I'm doing the clinical assessment as well. Um, so um, I normally don't write clinical notes if I'm listening to the client. I will only write my clinical notes at the end of the presentation, because uh, at the end of the consultation, because I want to be present for everything with my client. Um, if uh, you get very short on time. What you what you find that happens, uh, and with more experienced vets, what you find that happens is that uh, as you are listening and getting your history, you are also doing some parts of your examination already. Um, I uh, normally, if you need to go out and discuss cases, for instance, with a colleague because you're not sure about what's happening, you tend to do that um, once you have done your assessment and your examination, and you tend to try to come up with some excuses, let's put it like that, where you say that uh, you'd like to uh, see if there's certain medication available or that you would like to see there's a certain instrument that you'd like to use for your examination. Um, and then you go out and you find someone to discuss your cases or look through the notes or look for something on, on a book. I personally don't mind telling the clients you know what, I'm not sure about that. I need to check the doses for that medication. I need to see if I have that medication available. I have no problems about being honest and going and finding it. Uh, it also, of course, depends on the, the structure of the, the practice that you have. For instance, in my case, my first practice, we had a consulting room that was next to the dispensing room. So we would have a door outside and we would have a door to the dispensing room. That door would also, in the dispensing room, would lead to the next consultation room. So for instance, a lot of times it was very easy for me to get out of the uh, consulting room through the dispensing room to call the other vet. Or if there is no one in that room, I can just go out and go through the back and call for the other vet. But currently where I work, I have one consulting room and everything is in that consulting room. And I don't have another vet, so I have no one to ask for. And if I need to do something, I need to do it in the consulting room with the client. And I don't have an option for that. Um, I don't always like to do the history as I'm doing my physical examination. And you will see today, one of the things we're gonna focus on is um, two parts of the uh, consultation uh, for some of our tips. And like I said, even on my physical examination, I'm usually talking to the owner and the owners are talking to us. Um, one part that I like to talk about is a bit of a difference between trust and report. I, don't know, I do not know for sure how, and if this view is a, a, a view that is to do with a meaning of words, but I try to separate the two words with trust and report, where I try to um, think of trust as something that I'm, oh, uh, I'm getting from the client for showing professionalism, uh, for uh, being competent at what I'm doing, where I don't necessarily have a close relationship with this client, but the client sees me as a profession, so they trust that what I'm doing is correct. And the way to improve this is by uh, winning the pet over a lot of times when we're talking about uh, the UK in particular, or any country, any culture where the pet has the position of being a member of the family. When we do a good job with the pet and the pet likes us, the client quite often assume that we are good vets because the pet likes us. We then get report, which is when the client appreciates the way we're talking to them uh, and the interactions we have with the client and with the pet. So uh, a lot of times uh, we get two different feelings from our clients. And ideally what you want to do is you want to get both of them because if all you get is the trust, you don't necessarily have a lot of empathy from the owner to then follow through with your recommendations, even though they believe they are correct and they should do it. So 
if they, however, have some sort of rapport with you and they like you, they are much more inclined to do what you are asking because not only they believe you, but they also like you. Uh, some, trips, uh, some, some tips and tricks for this is to think that every interaction you have both with the pet and with the owner are going to score you points. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to increase the number of points that you uh, earn and reduce the, the number of points that you lose uh, with, with the clients, let's put it like that. Um, if you are focusing on your professional opinion and you're talking about the, the, the complications arising from a certain procedure and you're doing this in a professional way, then you're getting trust points. But if you are also doing this with a communication style that is understood by the client, you're getting report points as well. So uh, you are uh, gaining uh, different um, respect, let's put it like that. It's not respect, but we're talking about um, the, the perspective that and the opinion that the client has of you is going to be reflected by each and every single interaction that you have both with them as well as with the pet. And unfortunately, those are, those are situations we cannot always control. Um, but you will find very, especially um, if you are a person, for instance, that is a cat person, uh, and you are the person that uh, has basically more cat-friendly behaviors in the consultation room. One owner that comes to the consultation room with a cat that has been stressed in the past uh, for a simple booster, and you do a smooth consultation where the cat is not stressed, that client, you have earned a lot of points with that client, both from your professional job, but also from the relationship you develop with the cat. In the client's eyes, you uh, are a vet that the cat likes more. So they are going to ask to see you again, very likely next time. And you can get, um, you can get a client uh, to uh, come to see you specifically, specifically because of that. Um, I had another question on chat. Uh, Ella asks, is discussing your thought process with the client a good thing in your opinion or makes you think you are not confident? We're going to touch on that later. Uh, you have, to, you can and should discuss your thought process, but there is also a method for you to discuss your thought process, which is what we're going to talk about for a lot of our session today, uh, probably quite soon. Um, before, after we go through a few tips here for increasing your report, a lot of these you will do and you will know. Um, the first one is about names and treating people and treating clients by their name, particularly the pet name. Uh, the owner name, these are particularly important in uh, cultures that value relationship. Knowing the owner name is important for those where you are, um, so the more multi-active, which focus on the relationship with the person. Knowing the pet name is very useful for the linear active cultures uh, that uh, will value you for your interactions with uh, the pets. Um, it, it, you always earn points by being nice, polite, according to the, the culture uh, and the country norms for communication and smiling. Smiling uh, has, uh, of course, you don't want to fake smile because that's very obvious or communication is uh, something very clear. Um, uh, so soft uh, body communication, body language um, is something that is picked up very easily subconsciously. So you don't want to fake anything, but being nice and smiling uh, already transmits warmth and clients tend to be uh, warmer to people who are warmer to them. So they tend to be nicer to you as well, which is great because we don't necessarily want grumpy clients. Um, when we are listening to clients, we, and I particularly do this, we interrupt them and try not to interrupt. And instead, the trick a lot of times is to ask more questions or different questions. So a lot of times I did this as a trick when I did, uh, I worked in Scotland and they speak a different language here. Uh, so I, when I started working, would not necessarily understand what they were saying all the time. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, so uh, sometimes they would say something and I did not know what it meant. So instead of asking them to repeat and repeat and repeat, I would ask a different question. Uh, very commonly, they, I remember clearly someone said on the phone that their dog was bitten. And it's like, their dog is what? Bitten. I'm like, oh, oh, okay. I, don't, I have no idea what the dog is doing. So I asked her, so what exactly is he doing? What do you see him doing? What is he doing right now? And as I asked that, she explained to me what she saw the dog doing. Um, uh, and then, okay, okay, now I have a different uh, perception of what, it, what they are saying. 
Uh, confirming that we got it right is quite important, but it can be done in different ways. And you have to be careful with how you pose it so that you don't make your client think that um, you are not listening to them. Uh, culture adaptation, a few um, pointers. For those of you who are in the UK, you are in a conflict avoidant culture, um, which is the opposite of cultures, for instance, like Germany. Uh, in the UK, for instance, and in a lot of conflict avoidant cultures, which, for instance, we also have in, in Portugal, um, we are out of the European uh, countries, we are one that has longest, uh, uh, closest relation to, to the UK or one of the closest relations to the UK compared to the Mediterranean countries. Um, we want to avoid putting the client in a position where the client feels forced to say no, because that client does not want to say no in a lot of cases. They will perceive that as um, a source of conflict and they will avoid that. So you can put them in a place where they feel forced to say yes, even though they want to say no. Um, and and that, that causes some conflict. And uh, in these cases, you also want to avoid at all costs making the client feel guilty for what they're doing or for their decisions, uh, because they will also, uh, that's going to score negative points uh, for your opinion. However, if we're working in a culture that is more direct um, and uh, does not care so much about conflict avoidance, they, 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 they understand that conflict is there to bring up something good. When you are in that type of culture, you don't want to use understatements. You don't want to leave people guessing what you're meaning. You want to be direct with what you are saying, kind and direct with what you are saying, and be quite clear with the instructions that you are giving to these clients. Um, for the consultation and some of the areas and, and uh, answering to the previous question, we're going to focus on two particular client, uh, stages of the consultation, the, the, the mixture of clinical assessments and differentials, and then client discussion. Um, the this you've heard it but you may not do it or you may not do it in every single case uh, always 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 full physical examination from head to toe to tail or tail to head i go tail to head in the aggressive dogs um and your own method the one that works for you the way that i do it is i typically start head and go from head chest to legs which i remember because i don't always remember I don't, I don't, I don't uh, claim to have a good, necessarily perfect consultation strategy, but I tend to go from head to tail. So I'll go head. I will always go for eyes, ears, mouth, um, lymph nodes, open the mouth uh, and try, try to see inside the mouth as well. Go for chest and auscultation. Uh, do the pulse together with the chest auscultation. Go front legs. Uh, go abdominal palpation, unless it's a cat, where I tend to leave abdominal palpation for last. Um, and then a popliteal popli lymph nodes. Temperature, question mark, why? I don't do temperature personally in every single patient that comes to my consultation. If I have a booster, if I have a healthy patient, or if I have a recheck that is not uh, from a problem that has, is supposed to have a temperature, I don't do a temperature. If I have a patient that is coming for a medical consultation or there is something not right with them, they will get a consultation done. And um, uh, I just feel like a lot of times consultation is stressful, is distressing. Uh, in healthy cats, they mm, all get already a little bit more traumatized. If they're a bit on the edge, they can become aggressive uh, and makes the entire consultation much more complicated. Then I also think to myself, if I have a healthy patient with no changes on physical examination coming in for a booster and I have a high temperature, what is it going to change? I am unlikely to not vaccinate just for the high temperature, depending on how it is. And I'm probably just going to put it down to it's hot weather, it's been running outside, it's a cat, it's warm inside the car, it's warm inside the carrier. Um, and I'm not going to consider that they have a fever, I'm just going to consider that they have a high temperature. Uh, so. Of course, if it is a patient that is coming in for a health check for something that's wrong and the complaint, then they're going to get a temperature done and, and of course, registered. Uh, just a little story that I want to tell you uh, about the importance of full physical examination. Why? Because a lot of times, especially when we're pressed for time in consultations, we don't always do physical examination. If we have, for instance, a patient coming in for a skin recheck, been two years ago, one year ago, uh, four months ago for skin problems with dermatitis, it's probably atrophy. You see the patient, it's a Dalmatian, it's red, you give steroids again. You probably don't do a full physical examination on that patient, or you may not do a full physical examination on that patient. And they may miss little things on that. 
uh, very common as well, comes for gear problems. We check the years, we don't check the rest. Um, I always share a little story of a case that I saw as a locum, uh, the a cat that had been seen for uh, eye problems, the cat presented with a sore eye uh, by the two weeks before I checked the cat. Uh, the cat had an ulcer, was uh, positive for fluorescein and started treatment for the eye with antibiotic drops, uh, was rechecked one week later, was better, still had a slightly sore eye. The ulcer was still uh, present, but much, much smaller, so carried on treatment. When I saw the cat the, for the recheck, this was two weeks after the first diagnosis, and the cat had no stain uh, in the eye, no signs of ulcer, but still had a sore eye. And I also made the mistake on that consultation of looking at the eye first, because that it was a recheck appointment for the eye. But then I thought, no, 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 let's do this properly, uh, especially because I have an eye problem that's been going on, that's not been fixed, and I don't have a reason for this to be sore. When I open the cat's mouth, there is a hole in the top of the mouth. And doing the conversation to this client, that goes from your cat has an ulcer to put drops on the eye to your cat may have cancer, is very different and very dramatic in terms of communication with your client, right? Um, so I always tell the story, if you do this one in particular, if you do a full physical examination for all of your patients, you have much less chances of missing something like this. And therefore, you have more chances of getting the next part correct, which is your differential diagnosis, okay? Um, we have another comment from Elaine, Dr. Elaine. Uh, she had a client throwing tantrums because she doesn't want to be in queue, uh, uh, verbally abused uh, staff. Um, Prax owner doesn't want to fire the client despite it happened more than three times. How do you manage with clients in your practice? So you are very unlucky because you have a practice manager that is not doing what uh, most managers should do, which is uh, not let you speak to these clients. Um, clients that are rude, one, you can ignore the rudeness if you are strong enough to do that. Uh, you can and should uh, ask for your client uh, to not behave like that with you. Uh, but if you do not have the backup of your management, what I would say that you should do is you should just refuse to see the client, period. In this case, you yourself should refuse to see the client and you should basically tell your uh, practice owner, I'm sorry, I do not feel comfortable or confident seeing this person. Can you manage it? Um, it you as an employee do not need to protect. It's not your role to protect your uh, colleagues from abuse, if you can, great, but it's not your job. It's your manager job and your practice uh, owner job to do that for you. Uh, I don't wanna say in a clear way, uh, go find a different job or anything like that, uh, but it is your the practice owners and practice manager responsibility to deal with this client. If you are trying to diffuse the client, you have to do exactly the opposite of what uh, the client is doing in this case of being rude. You have to stay calm. Uh, you have to stay um, with very polite words. Be uh, assertive that, uh, I'm sorry, but if you continue to behave like this and talk to me like this, we're gonna stop conversations now uh, and you're gonna have to find a different fit to speak to you. Uh, or you can say, uh, I really don't appreciate you uh, behaving like this towards me and towards my colleagues. Um, so I, urge you to consider your approach to us. And if you're not happy with how we are trying to uh, work towards your dogs or cats uh, uh, welfare, then I'd urge you to find a different fit. Of course, if you are the boss, it's very easy to do this and just fire the client. If you do not have the lucky, uh, if you're not lucky enough to have a boss that uh, is protecting you, uh, the easy way for it to protect yourself is simply refuse to see the client. Um, of course, your boss is not going to be happy uh, and the colleague who's going to have to deal with the client is not going to be happy. But if all uh, employees refuse to see the client, the only person that should see the client is the boss or the practice manager, right? Um, uh, Courtney then asks, if what do you recommend when a patient comes in for vaccines or wellness and then on the exam uh, you find a hundred other things wrong, don't have time to dress them. <laughs> Right, okay, that comes next time, ne next 
the, on the next um, uh, communication and, and what you do when you find a lot of wrong things with a full normal uh, check. When you are doing your examination, as I was explaining, you are also talking to the client. Before doing the examination, you tell it to the owner that you're going to do it. I'm just going to examine Fluffy. Uh, or sometimes in the UK, you can even ask the fluff, Fluffy itself, Fluffy, I'm just going to have a look at you. Is that all right? Because owners a lot of times see that as an indirect message to them. And uh, what you do is you describe what you are finding, but you don't offer explanations until the end of your examination. So you'll describe, like you are saying here, Courtney. Um, okay, so I have a, a few lump masses here. I have tartar and plaque. I have gingivitis. I have um, obesity. I have three different things that I need to address with the client. And all they want and all they think that they need is a booster. Okay. How do you do this? You address this in the next stage, which is your discussion with the client, right? Um, you in the UK, it's very common for you to feel like you need to do everything in one appointment. Depending on what you have booked, um, you may need to split it in more than one appointment. Um, but unfortunately, this is one of the things in the UK. See, personally, what I do when I have a case like this is I address what I need to address in the consultation. And if it takes me 30 minutes, it takes me 30 minutes. Um, and, and most of the times I'm lucky enough that I can't uh, afford to do this because there's another vet working. Um, or if I'm in Portugal, which is fairly common, people are not always upset about waiting five or 10 more minutes because they understand that that can happen. Um, when you find lots of different things, you then explain them after you finish your examination. So I'm going to come back to you because before that, there's one thing extra that we need to discuss. Uh, which I'm going to discuss with you, which is on this next slide for any case that presents not for a health check, but uh, or for either a, a situations where you find something wrong or the patient is presenting because there is something wrong. The next slide is the most important slide that you're going to have on this presentation, which is whenever you have this patient, after you have your history and after you have your examination findings and you have all of the list of things that you told the owner i found this i found this i found this in the back of your mind what you have to be doing is you have to organize your differentials for the problems that that patient has so uh if you have here uh, in these cases four different changes in your uh, patient you then have to in your mind think about the top three differentials for each of those changes whether they're connected or not for the species that you have in front of you, in front of you, whether it's a dog or a cat or a bird or a, a, a budgie or a turtle uh, or a, a rabbit, for that breed in particular, it's different if it's a Jack Russell or if it's a Labrador. For the age of the patient that is presenting in front of you, and for the condition that it is presenting for, and when you start to, I a lot of people start to forget to do this as they start to go into busy consultations. Um, uh, 10 minute appointments and so on, you forget to organize in your mind. You don't have to talk to the owner yet, like we were saying before. Your thought process should be at this point, what are the three most likely differentials for this patient in front of me at this age from this breed that is presenting with these clinical signs? That we need to ask this to yourself and come up with three, no more than three or four, otherwise the clients won't pick it up three to four most likely differentials for your patient. And for all of you who are here, who are experienced or inexperienced, inexperienced, the difference between experience is that when you organize these differentials in your mind, if you are inexperienced, you may not have the right order. Or in other words, your order may not correspond to uh, the reality of what you find in clinical practice. If you are experienced, the most likely differentials for you are going to correspond to what is most likely in terms of probability for that patient to have. But this is also important. Why? Because while 80% of the cases that you see are going to have something that is common and that is part of your top three to five most likely differentials, the other ones are going to be unicorns. They're going to have something weird and funny 
that you're going to have to think about that you're going to have to think about after you ruled out this most likely differentials, right? So when you have lumps and obesity and a heart murmur and tartar and all of those things, some of them are just clinical signs that, and maybe not necessary, or they are a diagnosis, let's put it like that. Like if you've got plaque, what you need to do is you need to get rid of the plaque because it's got consequences. But if you have a mass, then you have to think for yourself, okay, I have a mass in a Labrador, or let's make it easy. I have a, a skin mass uh, that's growing in size, uh, that shifts size in a boxer that is nine years old, that has another small mass elsewhere. Uh, the most likely differentials for this are, well, I would say most likely differential for this is a mast cell tumor, right? It does not mean that there are not other differentials. It could, you could have other skin tumors. Uh, you could not, it may not be a skin tumor, it may be something else. But the most likely ones, those top three ones, are those ones. And you have to think about what's, uh, uh, what's the most likely in your mind for the client, okay? Um, and I've got a lot of questions now going, so I want to keep going this train of thought and then we make a pause and we go through the questions, right? So you want to get your differentials. That's very important for you to do. Uh, and maybe I've lied because actually the next slide is the most important in the webinar because having the differentials is not enough. You then need to find a way of communicating to the client what you want to do about those differentials, right? This is where it comes, we're talking about that, uh, that thought process. And this is the most important slide because the thought process you should have is possibly not the one that you were taught at university. When you have differentials, that's the right thought process, you should organize your differentials because that's probably what's wrong with the patient. When you have that, what you need to do is you need to stop thinking about diagnosing your patient and you need to start thinking about ruling out those differentials and if you've seen dr house you know that he does things in a funny way that's not how it should be done because he focusing focuses on differentials and then he focuses on very weird unlikely differentials and then he doesn't rule out the differentials he says i think he may have this disease let's treat him for this with some magic drug that is very dangerous um and then if it works he has it and then it doesn't work but it, so he does not rule out that differential uh, in many cases, sometimes it does, but it's a TV show, right? If you start to think about ruling out your differentials instead of diagnosing them, it makes an incredible shift in how you approach the cases and also how your clients perceive your work. And this is where we're going to have a little practical, uh, a little practical set session on the chat box. Now, I've seen there's lots of questions. I'm going, we're going to do this. And then we are going to uh, go over the different questions that you've had, uh, that you've put here, because I have um, I have missed one question. All right. So I have a little exercise for you. The first exercise, uh, this exercise is uh, Daisy. Daisy is presenting to consultation. She is a very cute twelve-year-old Yorkshire Terrier. She is presenting. Um, she's neutered. Uh, she's presenting because she recently started to drink more water. The owners noticed that she started to drink more water and she's asking um, to go to the toilet a lot more times than normal. They think she's eating very well. As a matter of fact, she seems to be hungry almost all the time. Uh, and they're a little bit concerned. I mean, they're very happy that she is uh, eating well. They think she may be putting on a little bit of weight. Um, but they're a little bit concerned that she's got something wrong because she's drinking so much water and she's, she's starting to ask several times a day to go to the toilets and there's been incidents where she's done it in the house. You examine uh, Daisy and you don't find anything obvious on physical examination because she, you've been lucky enough that she's had a dental uh, two months ago and her teeth still look fine. So you don't have any changes in the heart. Mucous membranes are uh, fine. They're nice, pinky, uh, moist. You've got a normal capillary refill time. None of your lymph nodes are increased. Um, your heart is normal, you've got no murmurs, you've got no uh, strange uh, lung sounds, you've got nothing on abdominal palpation, she doesn't seem to show any signs of discomfort, uh, and you have a normal temperature for her, nothing out of the ordinary. So now I want you to write down in the chat box what you would consider differentials, likely differentials, and I want only you to write down one or two 
or three, no more than three differentials, just come up with one differential, write it down on the chat box, what you think would be a differential for Daisy. Um, we have uh, a series of uh, pre uh, differentials coming up. So a lot of people have said Cushing's, we've got diabetes, we've got uh, hyperthyroidism, I think you meant hypothyroidism, not hyper, uh, diabetes, diabetes, UTI, so urinary tract infection, kidney disease, uh, diabetes. So we've got we've got a nice, nice, a nice list of three differentials here for her, right? We have um, Cushing's disease, we have diabetes, and then we have here a urinary tract disorder like a UTI or renal disease. There are others, of course, it could be something else, but these are the most likely. Everyone is agreeing to that. Now I want you to write down here what diagnostics you are going to suggest to this owner on the chat. And again, we are gonna have blood work and urine. We have got uh, CBC camps, so CBC is complete blood count, so it's hematology, biochemistry, urinalysis, blood urinalysis. Anything else that we wanna do? Uh, ultrasound, so sonar ultrasound. Okay, and this is for you to diagnose, right? What are you, in your urinalysis, what are you gonna ask for? Is it the, are you going to ask for culture and sensitivity? Are you going to ask for just a dipstick and sediment? What are you gonna ask for? We've got a culture here. What else are we gonna ask for? A glucose, a dipstick, sediment culture, a urinary protein, uh, a protein uh, creatinine ratio, so for UPC. Uh, urea creatinine, uh, specific gravity. So you're basically going to do full urinalysis uh, with sediment included. Okay, so basically for diagnosing, uh, no one, how, how come no one asked me uh, for the uh, Cushing's test? For the cost. But should you? do a, a Cushing's test, like a, a low-dose hexamethylone suppression test or an ICD stem test. Do after initial, so, so we already have the four thinking. Okay, no one, no one, no one asked for fructosamine either, probably because uh, you were thinking I'll do liver enzymes and anything else. Why? Uh, would you expect to see liver enzymes change? Anyway, sorry, now I'm advancing this. So you've done all these sorts of tests, for diagnosing this patient, right? You, you, you maybe not have done the, the, maybe what you would do is you'd stage it and you go for the blood work first. And then if you don't find anything, you go for the Cushing test after. Um, so you do your blood and urine first. Now, and maybe some of you said, maybe we're gonna do the ultrasound. Now, what you're trying to do is, okay, now you've got the urine cortisol here. What you're trying to do is you're trying to diagnose the disease. So you're trying to check if there's any signs of um, uh, so, some of you are not trying to check anything. They just want to see what's going on with the liver first before you do anything else. But that's not part of your differentials. So you didn't put differentials uh, as part of your differentials liver disease. So there's no particular reason for you to check the liver, except you do know that if you've got Cushing's, you may have uh, increased ALP. Um, so uh, and that just gives you a hint. It doesn't diagnose you anything. It doesn't mean there's a liver problem. Um, What's the biggest difference is you're doing this test to diagnose. But if you speak to the owner about ruling out all of these diseases, what's the test that you do to rule out pushing? Okay, so Anna wants to see all of the blood results. Fair enough. Yes, not just the liver. Yeah. But why do you want to see all the results? What does it give you? I'm asking the question different way. How do you rule out Cushing's? How do you tell the owner, I think your dog has Cushing's or your dog may have Cushing's. I'd like to make sure she's healthy and doesn't. So now you do the urine creatinine cortisol ratio. That No one told me about that except for Gonzalo who told me about cortisol first. And now we're talking about cortisol. So now, now if we talk about ruling out, you're talking about a different test that you haven't proposed before. Exactly, I asked how you rule out. So if you work your cases to rule out the diseases, you don't do the ACTH stim test or the low-dose suppression test, you do cortisol creatinine ratio. Okay, 
cortisol creatinine or creatinine cortisol cortisol creatinine ratio how do you rule out diabetes yes I, i'm saying i do the cortisol creatinine ratio before and i don't do blood blood glucose and urine for diabetes so i ask for a urine sample and i do a blood glucose yeah how do you rule out kidney disease and utis and i'm not asking about diagnosing i'm about ruling out urine out okay so now if i have a cortisol creatinine ratio that is normal i can tell the client you don't have pushings if my urinalis a doesn't have any glucose and and if my urinalysis i could do fructosamine but your urine there's no point in doing a fructosamine if you have uh, no glucose if your blood glucose is normal and your uh, you, you don't have any urine in the urine sample it's very unlikely that you've got diabetes so i can tell from the urine sample you don't have diabetes if i look at my specific gravity i don't have protein loss i don't have blood i don't have any changes i don't have an active sediment i can say unlikely that i have kidney disease unlikely that I have a UTI unless I have some sort of complication. If my cortisol creatinine ratio comes back normal and my urine sample is normal and my blood glucose is normal, I have ruled out all of my differentials. Now, if you put a list to your client, I'd like to do a blood sample for the blood glucose and I'd like to do a cortisol creatinine ratio versus I'd like to do blood work, uh, and the urine sample and the culture and sensitivity and the ACTH steam test or a low dose exomethyl suppression test and the ultrasound to make sure there's no masses. Which one do you think the client is most likely to agree to? Which one is also less expensive? But on the other hand, which one allows you to rule out the diseases? I, we didn't, um, I put here the culture and sensitivity for the UTI because if you have a completely inactive sediment and all of your blood work, com uh, your urine out is completely normal. It's unlikely that you have uh, uh, an infection of some sorts, but if something is not um, uh, normal or if you have protein loss or if your specific gravity is not uh, normal, then you would go and send it for culture and sensitivity. Thyroid levels. Uh, you could do thyroid, but we didn't say that hypothyroidism was one of the top three differentials. Uh, Dogs don't usually have hyperthyroidism, and hyperthyroidism tends to cause uh, loss of appetite, uh, more lethargy, bradycardia, and uh, occasional PUPD. I have diagnosed hyperthyroidism in two dogs in my career. Uh, and I think most of the times hyperthyroidism is secondary to something else going on. Um, but if, if everything else comes back normal here, then you start to think, okay, next three differentials. Now, maybe I'm going to look for hypothyroidism, or maybe now I'm going to look for weird liver diseases, or a brain tumor, <laughs> which is the next thing that causes PPD, or an ultrasound. Um, now I'm going to suggest the ultrasound for the bladder and the kidneys to see what's going on here, or I'm going to do different tests. So uh, in this case, like I was saying, uh, of course, you could always, there's then a sequence, uh, depending on the first test that you do. And like we were seeing, the, the owner is much more likely to agree to saying, I want to test this out to make sure that she doesn't have diabetes and she doesn't have uh, um, hyperthyroidism and she, or hypothyroidism and she doesn't have Cushing's and she doesn't have urinary stones and she doesn't have a urinary infection. Um, uh, and a lot more times they are happier to say yes to you agree, uh, uh, suggesting, I want to make sure Daisy doesn't have this versus saying, I think she has a Cushing's and I'd like to test it for Cushing's. Because here's what's happened. You tell the owner, right? I think she could have Cushing's disease. This is this fancy disease that you explain the disease. You get the owner sometimes a little bit confused. And um, I'd like to run the test to see if she has Cushing's. This test is involves taking blood samples. It costs this much money. Um, and and uh, it may or may not give us a good answer. If she has Cushing's, we can start treating her. And it's probably going to give us an answer. But if it comes back negative, we're not entirely sure about it. Uh, then you, the owner agrees to it because they want to see if the dog has Cushing's or no. You take the patient in. And if you are lucky, it's going to be a very clear cut. Yes, it's for Cushing's. In most of the cases, it's going to be in that borderline area where it's like, eh, maybe it's Cushing's, probably Cushing's, most likely Cushing's, but it could be something else. It could be false results. Uh, and then you have to tell the client, 
it could be Cushing, you're not entirely sure, you need to do more tests and do this, and it's compatible. And may... So the, you, you told the owner, I think it's got Cushing, and now you're telling him the, either the results are normal or they are inconclusive. If you tell the client, I'd like to make sure that she doesn't have Cushing, now, I don't have a very definite test for that, but there is one test that is simple to do, not very expensive. And if it comes back normal, um, we can be quite sure that she doesn't have it. If it's not normal, it doesn't mean that she doesn't have it. Uh, it I'm not able to rule it out. So I would then do a test to see if it is confirmed that she does have it. And that test is an low-dose hexamethasone suppression test or an ACTH stimulation test. Um, so the owners are much more likely to accept this. But also your thought process is completely different and your diagnostics can also be different. For a patient like this, I would not necessarily do a full biochemistry to start with. I would do a biochemistry if my cortisol creatinine ratio is normal, so I don't have pushing. My blood glucose is normal. My urine analysis is normal. So I don't know uh, what, what else could be going on. I need to consider our differentials. Then at that case, maybe now I want to allow kidney disease properly although my urine analysis suggests I don't have it, maybe I'm going to be a bit more specific and I'm going to search for an SDMA. Maybe I'm going to rule out liver disease by doing a, a, an ultrasound and running blood tests here. Uh, and maybe now I want to rule out other weird things like she's got like fancy diabetes insipidus or something like that, or uh, something going with the high calcium or electrolytes. And now I want to do my blood to rule out that, right? Um, so we've, we've done this, uh, this little exercise here. How do you actually communicate with the client? Because this is a thought process that you did and you with your professional skills and competence and knowledge, you know that for these differentials, you have certain tests that you use to rule them out. Uh, but now you need to explain this to the owner, right? And get them to agree. There are three important steps. The first step is to explain to them what is happening. Make sure they are clear about that. Uh, how you're going to do the test and why you want to do each of the tests. And of course, here, the reason for the why is, is it's got to be related to something that matters to this uh, owner. So the why here is, I want to make sure that he doesn't have that or she doesn't have that. She doesn't have that issue. She doesn't have that disease. How would I normally communicate? Uh, this is an example. I wrote it up. I don't necessarily say this like this, but let's imagine for Daisy, uh, I have finished my examination. Uh, I have finished my history. And I'll, I'll basically tell the client. So from my uh, examination, everything is normal. Um, there's nothing out of the ordinary. But from your description, there is something potentially uh, going on with Daisy. Um, from uh, everything, putting together what you've told me and what I have found, there's a few conditions that I'm worried about uh, that I think could be affecting Daisy. Um, there's three that I think are most likely, uh, all of them could cause what's going on with Daisy. One of them is diabetes. Um, the other disease is a disease called Cushing's. And the uh, other disease that could be taking place uh, is a, a something related uh, with the, the urinary uh, system. So we're talking about kidney disease or an infection in the bladder. Um, and based on these diseases here, which all cause what's wrong, uh, the signs that we are seeing with Daisy, uh, I would like to run some tests to make sure that Daisy doesn't have any of this. Uh, so I'd like to um, make uh, uh, run some tests to make sure that she doesn't have diabetes. Um, I'd like to make to do some tests to make sure she doesn't have um, kidney disease or bladder issues, and that she doesn't have pushing. Right? I recommend um, doing all of these tests initially um, to make sure that all of these diseases, we can be happy that uh, Daisy doesn't have any of them. And now I'd like to explain to you what these different tests are uh, and how we would do them, right? Um, for the diabetes, the test is very straightforward. I'm just going to take a very small sample here. Uh, I'm going to take a little, do a little ear prick, check her sugar levels. If she has diabetes, the sugar levels will be very high. And I'm also going to find sugar in her urine. So we're going to need to get a urine sample. Now, for the uh, Cushing's disease, which is a disease where they produce stress hormone, I want to check in the urine that she's not producing too much of that. So I'm going to ask for a, a urine sample. The good thing is with that urine sample, I can also see if there's any signs of infection in the bladder or if the kidneys are working fine. 
So uh, what we what I'm recommending is that we do this little blood test here today and we get a urine sample from her to run all of these tests, right? Um, based on that, uh, if all of these results are normal, I can be fairly confident or we can be fairly confident that Daisy doesn't have any of these diseases. Uh, if, however, the, the, these results are not normal, which I suspect is possible that we're going to find because these are the most likely uh, diseases, then if these are not normal, we may need to do some more tests uh, to confirm what's wrong with Daisy. So, for instance, if there's something wrong with the kidneys or with the bladder, we may need to scan her. If there's something wrong with the, the stress hormones, we may also need to look at the gland that produces the stress hormones. Um, and if, if we have diabetes, we may need to confirm that with a different test. Um, if you want to be fully confident that there's nothing wrong with the bladder and with the kidneys, the urine sample is not always enough if it comes back normal. And, and we could run more tests with a bladder scan or with some blood work as well. But in an initial stage, that may not be necessary because if everything comes back normal with the urine, uh, we can be quite, quite confident that that's not likely to be the, the case. Uh, for me to run the test, I'm going to need to collect a urine sample from Daisy, and then I'm going to explain you how to do that. And then I will need to do the, the, the sugar test today here. The, the test costs this much money. Is it all right if you go ahead with all of this? Of course, this is not the conversation that I would do. I, there's, there's different things that I would do. There's different causes that I would do. There's different questions that I would ask. I would tend to separate different diseases and explain things at a time. Then at the end, I would pick things a lot. Um, at the end, I will confirm, are you happy with this? Uh, are you happy with us doing this? Uh, are you okay with the costs? And just to repeat, I'd like to do this blood test and this blood test. Um, flexibility then comes from what you guys were saying as well, where we don't do everything at the, uh, you know, at the same time. Um, we won't do all the tests necessarily at the same time. We can go back. Let's see if I can go back. Uh, we can go back to, uh, let me just, do a little uh, we can go back to our differential list and to our test and we can decide you know what if they cannot afford to do all of it here maybe i'm going to do the blood glucose and the urine first and then i'm going to save that urine for a cortisol creatinine ratio if they cannot afford it maybe i'm not going to do imaging maybe i'm not going to do the blood work to start with i'm going to see what results are normal Instead of going out and fishing for everything, we try to simply go and rule out the most likely differentials with the most certainty that we have, because we don't always have a certainty. So, for instance, for Cushing's, we do know that if we have a normal cortisol creatinine ratio, it's quite unlikely. There's about 97 percent chances that that dog does not have Cushing's. So there's about 3 percent chances, if I remember it correctly, 3 percent chances that it's a false result and the dog has Cushing's. So it's much more likely to have something else than pushing in this case. Great. Diabetes. If you have high blood glucose with urine, uh, with glucose in the urine, there's a fairly high chance that your patient has diabetes. You cannot rule out diabetes based on those results. So if you want to try to rule out diabetes, now you need to do different tests like fructosamine. And if that's normal, you can rule out diabetes or you can, with a high level of certainty, rule out diabetes. You can also do fructosamine in the first instance because fructosamine is what you would use to rule out diabetes. But at the same time, if you are going to rule out other tests, it's more effective for the owner to run a urine sample and have those results first than to do the urine sample with the blood work with the fructosamine to have it all tested, right? And then, of course, you are okay to go ahead and uh, test more things with the, with the owner. One thing to remember, and I say it here, if the owner cannot do all the tests, it's not your fault and it doesn't make you a bad bet, especially if you are suggesting the test and think about selecting the test to rule out your conditions instead of trying to diagnose. Try to choose the best test that allows you to rule out the conditions you're worried for, right? Because it's going to be money more well spent for the owner and it's going to give them more peace of mind because you're telling them, Okay, relax. This is a difficult disease. It's a difficult condition. We've tested. We make sure it doesn't have it, or we have a high certainty that he doesn't have it, right? Um, important. If you use a treatment to rule out a disease, you are not being a bad bet. 
most obvious example, if you see a patient that has skin disease and you think maybe it's Demodex, if you want to diagnose Demodex, you're going to do a lot of skin scrapes. If you want to rule out Demodex, you're going to put Drovectin. Which one is cheaper? Which one works? If you try to diagnose, you may not find anything, you're still going to treat. If you want to rule out uh, uh, Demodex, you put a Brevecto or uh, you give out a similar medication that you know kills Demodex and you assess the response of your patient. And if your patient improves because you have done that, you have, uh, you have been able to tell, you can now tell the owner, right, if he's responded positive to that, there is a chance that he did have, um, that he did have uh, mites. But if your patient keeps getting worse, you can tell your clients, right, because we have treated for mites and he's getting worse, it's unlikely that he had mites. So the client is again, much more likely to agree with you putting a brevector than you doing skin scrapes and maybe sedating the dog to do skin scrapes around the eye. And then maybe at the end say, I couldn't find a lot of them or I found some, so we may have it. Now we're gonna treat it. Um, what you do not want to do, and it happens a lot uh, if you are pressed for time, as you, you, some of you have mentioned, is you start to see the patient and you think, oh my God, this is a pyo. This is a pyometer. It is like 100% a pyometra. Um, and some people, what they do is they start to look at the differentials and see, no, this is the one that it has. Without ruling out anything, they just take it for granted and then they start treating it, but they've not actually ruled out anything else. For instance, with Daisy, most of you said, uh, when we asked for differentials, most of you said Cushing's. Some people, and you, 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 some of you may know this type of people, some people will look at the dog and say, I think you've got Cushing's, I'd like to start treating you for Cushing's. But they did not rule out anything else, okay? And that's what you do not want to do, right? Um, what if you suspect multiple things going on at the same time? You do this for every single one of them, or you try, and basically what you try to do is you try, and these are the ones, these are the appointments that you split. Uh, and you get the clients to come back for a second appointment or for a third appointment. You address the most pertinent thing at a time. And you also consider in your differentials that they may be linked, and they may be together, or uh, they may be uh, related to each other, okay? So let's say that, and for instance, this is a very typical case uh, with this, with Daisy. You could have uh, a cortisol creatinine ratio that is not normal, which means you cannot rule out Cushing's, and you could have blood glucose, high blood glucose with um, glucose in the urine, and you could have a low specific gravity with protein loss and blood, which means you were not able to rule out any of your top three differentials, which means now you need to do an ultrasound to rule out causes. Uh, uh, now you need to rule out uh, causes of bladder issues and kidney issues. Now you need to do blood work to rule out renal disease. Now you need to do culture insensitivity to rule out urinary infection. Now you need to do fructosamine to rule out diabetes. And now you probably need to do an ACTHT test to rule out Cushing's or to diagnose Cushing's. And if you diagnose Cushing's, then you start to think, do I have diabetes because of the Cushing's? Do I have urinary infection because of the Cushing's or because of the diabetes? Because you can have more than one thing at the same time and Daisy could have all of them. But if you don't rule them out, you don't know which one it is. If you run the test and they're all abnormal, then you could not rule out any of them. You need to keep ruling out Cushing's. You need to keep ruling out diabetes. You need to keep ruling out urinary infection. So if you cannot rule out Cushing's, the patient probably has Cushing's. If you cannot rule out diabetes, the patient probably has diabetes. Then you know from your, um, medical experience and knowledge that patients that have Cushing's may develop diabetes, for instance. And you also know that these patients may develop urinary infection, for instance. So then you start to put different things together at the same time. Um, and some clients will be annoyed having to come back to have more bloods taken again. Take bloods for all of them and save the bloods. Uh, that's what we tend to do. We take the bloods, take the bloods for all of the tests, run the ones that you need to do, and then you already have the bloods uh, saved here at the clinic um, for other tests that need to be done. The only ones that you ne don't necessarily want to do is uh, hematology with that because hematology does tend to have issues. 
when you do that. But for most of the for most of the cases, for you to uh, rule out infection, you want to do that quite immediately. To rule out anemia, you want to do that quite immediately as well, um, and you can do them all together. Um, uh, but let's go back to some of the questions because we are uh, nearing the end of our session today and we still have a few questions uh, that uh, some people were asking. So I'm going to go back to uh, the questions, make sure we didn't miss anything. Um, there was uh, uh, one question that I missed, which is how is quality care assured when you have to do all this in a short space of time? Um, this is why you have your structure in place. Uh, so this is why you have uh, uh, your history done, your examination, your organizer differentials, you do your discussion with uh, of differentials based on the client uh, ruling out, wanting to rule out the diseases, you provide them what you're going to do, how you're going to do them, why you want to do that, and uh, you uh, give them an estimate of the cost. This is a mistake we don't we do in other countries a lot in, in indicate standard to offer the cost for everything. In other countries it's badly seen, but then clients don't like that. So I tend to say the price to everything and make sure the clients agree with it, because how can you make an informed decision if you don't know how much money it's going to cost you? Um, and then if you don't have time, you make the time. So I, I, I am not the best uh, employee for practices, because if the client needs time to understand it, I will give them the time to understand it. Or there are ways of you gaining time, which is you ask them to come back so you ask them to focus only on one problem, which comes back to one of the questions we were having on a health check, for instance. You ask them to come back for a recheck, or you ask them to come back, come back specifically, specifically to address that one problem that you think is the most important one. Uh, and it's fairly common for me to do this when uh, someone was describing multiple things happening in a consultation, uh, like a normal health check. How, how would you do that? Um, I will do if i can do the vaccination i'm going to do the vaccination here's why because the, the client can because of the vaccination if i don't do it he's not going to think i've done a good job so i'm going to do the vaccination whenever it's possible for me to do the vaccination if it's not possible i'm going to explain why it's not possible in a very clear way that the owner understands and agrees with if they don't agree with it i mean but i'm in trouble because they don't see why uh, i am forcing them out of their way uh, they need to understand that and if you need time you need time then I will say, now, this is a problem. I'd like to address this problem. Now, there's two options. We can either do it today, or what I recommend is, I recommend we book him in next week or a time that you are free. What we're going to do is we're going to do the test. We're going to take a sample from the mass. I'm going to look at it on the microscope. I'm going to see if it looks like there is any sort of uh, badness in the mass, and we're going to have results fairly quickly, or I'm going to send it to the lab or we are going to admit to do an ultrasound of, uh, of the bladder, or I would like you to bring over a urine sample. Uh, and uh, those are cases where you would book them in for another appointment for that problem that you think is a problem and you need to convince the owner that it's a problem. Otherwise, you're not coming back for that. Um, the, uh, so about the discussion, the thought process with the client. You want to discuss your differentials and the reason why you want to rule them out, uh, like we were seeing. Okay. Um, uh, okay. So uh, I just want to check. I got the names right. Uh, so I then had here. I had Courtney also asking about uh, 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 having se several things wrong at the same time. Uh, that you are expected to address everything in one consultation and then you don't know how to ask clients to uh, come for another appointment. You basically say in your appointment, I recommend that we make an appointment for him at a time that suits you to address this in particular. Uh, so we can talk about all the different options and we can start treatment. Or if you can do a phone appointment, book a phone appointment with them. Words like, I recommend, score your points because you're saying, my professional opinion is, that we do this. You're not saying, I think that as an amazing person that loves animals, we should do A or B or C. You're saying, as a professional, as a veterinary professional, my opinion is that we should do this. I recommend that we should do this, particularly in countries that uh, are task oriented, like UK, Germany, etc. If you say, my, my professional recommendation is that we do euthanasia, or my professional recommendation is that we do this blood test, the owners will take that into consideration. If they understand why, they will most likely agree to doing it if they can, because if they cannot, they're not going to do it. Um, 
going back to some of the most recent questions that we are now having here. Um, let me see if I don't miss anything. Uh, Mohamed, there is no book, uh, but there is a course. I will send you the link at the end. Um, if you suspect, like I said, if you suspect multiple things at the same time, you address one at a time and you do the same thought process for all of them. And then what you try to do is you try to get what's the test that is going to allow you to rule out most of them at the same time. And a lot of times it tends to be urine tests uh, or it tends to be biochemistries. Um, any tips on how to prevent the owner from feeling overwhelmed uh, in that situation where your tests also are coming up abnormal? Yes. So you take your time to explain one at a time and you prepare the owner for long conversations, usually over the phone, long conversations. Uh, you will find, however, that most of the times you're going to have simple cases, unless you work in countries like Portugal, Spain, etc., where the owners wait a long time to come to the vet and where you have a lot of concurrent diseases. In the UK, in Central Europe, in Finland, most of the times the, page, the owners come to the practice with uh, one problem, one condition, uh, and then, then you may have something else uh, related or connected. But the tip would be to discuss the result as in. So we came back with this result. Let's imagine the, the Daisy that have everything. Uh, well, most likely Daisy has Cushing's and then everything else is secondary, but she could have Cushing's and kidney disease separate because, because she's uh, old and she had horrible mouth. For instance, um, you would tell the owner, okay, so I have your tests back and I have a lot of results that I want to discuss with you, all right? So remember how we did that one test to rule out Cushing's, that's the disease with the stress hormone. Um, uh, the result came back uh, abnormal, which means that I'm not sure, I cannot be sure with this that she doesn't have Cushing's. Now, to complicate things a little bit more, the diabetes test also came back abnormal. So I'm also not able to guarantee that she doesn't have pushing, she doesn't have diabetes. Now, it is possible that the two are connected and she doesn't have true diabetes. She just has the diabetes because of the pushings. So my next step would be to investigate pushings first and not diabetes. The downside is the diabetes is easier to, to because I still have the blood and I can run those bloods. Right. Um, but if the Cushing, the next test that I do is to, to see if she does have it. In that case, uh, if it comes back abnormal, we can start treating her for that and we can see if diabetes goes away. Now, the urine test also showed changes, which means I'm not sure if Daisy has already a level of infection going on. Now, for me, the next step for me is to send this urine or collect urine by cysto to uh, see if she has an infection. And again, this infection could be just because of the pushings that she may have, but we still need to treat that. Um, so you do this conversation slowly, you stop the conversation at, at different times, and you, at the end of everything, summarize the time. So with this in mind, I would like to, in the UK you would do this because this is the culturally appropriate way of asking for things, I would like to do this, I'd like to admit her. Uh, I'd like to book her in to stay with us to do uh, the Cushing's test. And while she's here, we will also take a urine sample to uh, check for infection, right? The cost of this would be X. Are you okay with this? Shall we book her in? When do we book her in? And um, so, uh, of course, you do this with causes, asking them, do you have questions about this? And, but you'll find most of the times this is not going to happen to you. It's going to happen in countries where the, the dog has leishmania, but also has heartworm. And now you have to do a one hour appointment to explain the treatment for heartworm and the treatment for leishmania. And you don't have a way around that unless you don't get an informed consent from the client because you didn't explain everything. Okay. To sum everything up, because I think maybe I've, okay, I've not done one hour. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. Um, sum it all up. You, you want to adapt to what you are doing to the client, uh, but also the country that you're working in, the culture you are integrated. Always do a physical examination. Another reason for you to do a physical examination, you will do so many physical examinations in healthy patients that whenever there's something off, you may not know it's off, but you're like, oh wait, this is not what a heart is supposed to sound like. 
you don't know if it's an arrhythmia, you don't know if it's a funny eating block, you don't know what it is, but it's like, this is not normal, there's something. And it perks your uh, intellect to, there's something here, okay? Always start every time you do an appointment with a patient that has something wrong, think of top three differentials for that patient. Uh, some of them will be super obvious, others will not be so obvious. And it will be very obvious for you to see the top one or top two, which is great. Just rule them out first and then think about the others. Um, but try to start to focus. See the difference it's going to make for you when you start to think of differentials as uh, diseases to rule out versus diseases to start diagnose. And whenever trying to communicate with the owner, follow these three principles. Explain or try to explain what is going on or what you want them to do, how they're supposed to uh, make it happen and why you want it done. And this works for everything. It also works for uh, prescribing medication, for instance. Um, how you, why you want them to be cage restive if they're limping, uh, what medication you want them to give, how to apply the eardrops. It works for everything that you do in practice as well, okay? Um, I'm not able to get <laughs> to the next slide. Uh, finally, this is your QR code for those of you who are in the UK and you need to put this webinar. Uh, it has been put down as one hour, but feel free to change it to an hour and a half since we are been here uh, answering your questions as well. Um, I have put a few questions for you to reflect on. Uh, coming back to trust and report, uh, have a little thought about uh, things that you can do to uh, earn more points, score more points with your clients, and have a little reflection about whether you feel like you've been taking shortcuts in some of your consultations, how that's made you feel and why you think that is happening. And unfortunately, I know for many of those of you who work in the UK, most of the reasons, most of you, most of you are going to be doing this because you feel like you don't have enough time, which is why I am one of those people that I was always very happy when I could do it in 15 minutes, but I was also happy enough that I worked in a place where if I need to take 25 minutes to explain a pile, I could take 25 minutes and I would take 25 minutes because you can explain all of this in a short period of time that then the owner probably doesn't understand because they're going to feel overwhelmed like you've been saying, okay? Uh, you will also have access to these on your um on the recording so you can always go back to it and get it from the recorded version and for those of you who are uh, interested in going to the next level i just wanted to let you know a little bit more about the academy that we are running at univet global uh, because we have created them with a specific environment and specific principles that we use to allow people who join these academies to actually develop their skills to actually develop the confidence to do this in uh, first opinion practice when they go back to work and uh, our academies, we have several running, which I'll uh, put to you below. Um, we have four main principles that we run in all of our academies, whether they are in person or not. The first one that we do, and I, we think that this is very important and probably quite unique, is to have a very specific environment, which is a neutral environment in terms of um, workplace. So we tend to do a lot of our academies in overseas countries, either in Portugal or in Spain when they are in person instead of doing them in the UK or in Northern Europe, where most of the people are from, because it brings you from the triggers of clinical practice itself. We then focus heavily on practical procedures. So all of our in-person academies are 100% practical, where you are supposed to be doing the procedure. You're not supposed to be helping someone do the procedure. You're not supposed to be um, watching it, you're not supposed to be studying about it, you're supposed to be doing those procedures. Uh, we also do this by providing very, very strong immersion. So we will have long academies, they are always five days long, where you are doing just that. And of course, there is no point in doing all of that if you don't have the proper feedback. So we focus heavily on having tutors that are uh, vets, that are experienced, and that uh, are from the real world. So vets that see the case that you would be seeing as well, and not vets that have all the fancy equipment uh, for everything. So we focus heavily on the competence for daily practice, but also the confidence that you need. And we believe that you are gonna get that confidence from experiencing the competence, not necessarily having uh, competence, but feeling like you know what you are doing. That's what's gonna bring you the confidence. Um, for those of you who uh, are interested in having a little look at the different academies we have running, we currently have uh, four academies. The first academy, several of you would have heard about it before, is Spay Academy Spain, 
It is a five day academy that we do in Spain where all we do is Spain beaches. So it is just for beach space. You're supposed to be doing the beach play on your own. You have two instructors there to uh, help you, provide you practical tips. Um, the next one is going to take place in May this year. And we still have a couple of uh, vacancies if you are interested in joining that experience. Uh, we have an alternative uh, academy, uh, which is online academy. That academy has registrations open right now. And it's quite different because it's distance based. So you cannot pay something by distance, but you do have a model here that you can use to practice the skills. And you have, of course, the course online available, which has the instructions and you have a tutor available as well to share everything. So Spay Academy Online starts in April, but the registrations are now because we have limited vacancies and because everyone needs to receive their training kit in time for the, for the course to start. Uh, it is a four week long course every new week there's a new module. But you have lifetime access to that, then this year, this is the first year we're going to have two new academies in September. The first academy we're going to have is an ultrasound academy, it is the same principles of Spain Academy Spain, but this time it is in Portugal, it is going to have five days of abdominal ultrasound. Um, again where you're going to be ultrasounding yourself you're going to be doing abdominal ultrasound uh, during five days morning and afternoon with the experience with the follow-up of one uh, uh, very experienced tutor that is also dedicated to teaching ultrasound skills uh, in practice where you can use different types of ultrasound machines so you don't have just access to the fancy ones but you also have access to the fancy ultrasound machines that you actually have in practice which are not that fancy at all, <laughs> as many of you know. Um, uh, we are still getting information about that course. And finally, in Spain, we're going to have the first, I ah, forgot to mention, Ultrasound Academy includes a four, uh, six week course uh, with all the technical and theoretical principles of ultrasound. So that when you go to the practical course, you already have that background knowledge and you don't need to learn everything in five days. Um, ultrasound Academy Portugal, I think is going to be amazing. I'm really excited for it because I think five days of scanning an abdomen is going to be many more hours than most vets have done in their careers, uh, unless they've had several years of uh, experience with ultrasound. Um, Anesthesia Academy is the first one we are running as well in September. It will also be in Spain in the same environment as Spain Academy Spain, but it is going to have more advanced uh, anesthetic monitoring. And the purpose of Anesthesia uh, Academy is for you yourself to run uh, anesthesias in uh, your patients from beginning to end, follow up with the recovery, establish protocols for all of them and do the entire monitoring uh, during the procedures. And we are talking about open abdomen surgeries. So it gives you experience with full general anesthetics, which can last for long periods of time. So we're talking about uh, one hour to two hours, sometimes three hour long anesthetics. Um, and it gives you an opportunity to train different protocols, make different decisions again, you are responsible for your patients, but you have the assistance of a tutor that is going to give you practical tips on how to decide what to do. And it's going to um, make you feel confident that you can do what you want to do. Uh, if you are interested in learning more about any of these, just let me know, send me an email. Uh, I will send you the information about them. I'll, I'll send you the website the pages for the ones that have website pages. My email is Andrea with an I after my E. Uh, at univets.global and I'm always happy to receive feedback about everything as well. Uh, I will leave here a few more um, information uh, for you. If you'd like to follow us on Facebook, we have a Facebook page. Uh, and if you want to follow us on Instagram, you also have um, an Instagram uh, for, uh, for you to follow up. If you have any more questions, feel free to put them on the chat. I have received a few, um, a few uh, messages here, which I will have a look at. Uh, oh, a lot of people thanking us. Um, and Francisca asking about if the academy is going to be in Portuguese or English. It is English, in English. All of our academies will be in English as we have uh, mostly vets from Europe joining all of our academies. So they will be in English, both the theoretical part and the um, attendance part. But of course, uh, we always have someone from the country itself to speak the language. So when we go to Spain, we have people who speak Spanish. Usually one of the tutors will speak Spanish. Um, in uh, Spain Academy Portugal for the ultrasound. 
uh, we are most likely going to have just me speaking Portuguese, but I'm not going to be teaching uh, much. I'm going to be assisting. Um, we don't have the defined dates for September. Uh, we also don't have uh, the location 100% confirmed. It should be around um, uh, Lisbon, not in Lisbon precisely. Uh, the dates, we are still pending the dates because we need to match them uh, with uh, the Anesthesia Academy. So because we are pending the Anesthesia Academy, we have not done September uh, dates for the Ultrasound Academy or not. But um, if you are interested in joining, send me, send me an email because I will add you to the email list. And uh, then what I do is I email everyone where it is, when it is, the costs, how it works, and so on. Uh, we, we do one thing with all of our academies that are attendance academies. If it is uh, an academy in Spain or in Portugal, we already include accommodation and we already include your meals uh, in uh, the academy. So you already have everything uh, set up there. And Francisco says you already sent an email. So you are already in the email list to receive the information. We probably will only know in May the confirmation for uh, uh, Anesthesia Academy, which is when we will know as well for, uh, uh, for, um, for the ultrasound. Academy, but I will make sure that we all know. Uh, do you have any more questions that you'd like to share with me? Or are you all happy to go and have a little tea and dinner? I have to thank you all so much for staying uh, for, for so, such a long period of time. I hope you have enjoyed it. I hope you have uh, taken some information from that. And again, uh, thank you so much for uh, spending your time and sharing your time with me tonight. Um, and I will keep you posted on future webinars. We are looking to have some guests to run a few more webinars like this, but hopefully a little bit shorter. I just like to talk, as you can tell. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much for joining. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.